How's that? Does that sound better? We doing okay with that? With that fact? Very good. I thought I was about to get the day off. <laughs> Just go home and uh, no mic. <laughs> but no, uh, uh, appreciate the men. Boy, they do a great job in, in, in keeping us going with everything that uh, you see, and we certainly appreciate them. But uh, so Noah Cropland, <clears throat> we want to remember him in our prayers. And then Kathy's sister, Rosalind, received very encouraging news recently uh, and uh, said that uh, they will be able to operate. And I think I saw this like only 20% uh, is, is operable uh, who, who, who have this, but she is among the 20%. So we're thankful for that. Kathy's back home. She's with us. And um, they, they've not had surgery yet, but that's, that's good news. So we're, we're thankful, thankful for that news. Other uh, prayer requests? This, this, mm -hmm. Okay. Chris's boss did have his surgery, the, the spinal surgery through his neck, and all went well with it. Recovery a little longer than they're expecting, uh, originally expected, but but you're on the you're on the plus side. That's good. That's good. So surgery was successful. Any other prayer requests? <laughs> Nancy and she's the one that's on hospital. Okay, yeah. Uh, Ruth and Naomi's cousin Nancy Gooch. She lives in Georgia. And a week or so ago, she was sent home on hospice. And so um, we want to uh, keep this family in our prayers as well. Okay, let's, uh, let's pray. Our God and Father in heaven, we're thankful for this beautiful day that you've given us, an opportunity to assemble together, to study the Bible with one another. We're grateful for all of our classes and opportunities that we have to study together with teachers and students. And the knowledge that's represented in this congregation and in this room and this hour that allows us to share that knowledge with one another as we seek to grow uh, closer to you, draw near to you, and closer to one another in our church family. Pray that in all things we will glorify you uh, each and every day. Father, we're, we're mindful of Noah and uh, ask your blessings to be upon him and his health uh, at this time. And, and all of our children, Father, we know that uh, uh, time of the year when, when many are not well and it's difficult for all, especially children, we pray that they can be strong and healthy. Uh, Father, we're so thankful for the, the, the good report from Kathy's sister, Rosalind. We pray your blessings will be upon her and uh, the, the upcoming days and when the surgery shall be that her body will be strong for it uh, we, we pray that, uh, that all will, will be well and the decisions made would be the best for her health and her life Father we uh, pray for Nancy we ask your blessings to be upon her at this time and uh, be with Ruth and Naomi and all the family they will do all that they can to encourage her and, and, and to help her uh, at this time we're thankful for the, the good report of the successful surgery with uh, Chris's boss and pray your blessings will be upon him now as he as he recovers father we continue to pray for for those in in, in israel and ukraine and Myanmar and, and, and nations like this afghanistan where there's much trouble pray that, um, that there could be more peaceful solutions to the the evil that we see and especially father we we pray for for those who are in, in not in a position to protect themselves, or take care of themselves. We think of the young, the shuddy, and the elderly. And ask your blessings to be upon them in these regions. Help us as your children to do all we can to spread the good news, the peaceful news of Christianity throughout the world. Help us to seek the lost in all that we do and to glorify you. Please be with our members, our families who will travel over the next couple of weeks. Help them to be safe. And those who will come to us, uh, we pray your traveling mercies to be upon them. Thank you for your son Jesus, for his life, for his sacrifice. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, we're continuing our study, the Kings. Let's see where we are here. This might be a different one. I'll get to where we are. Here's where we are. Let me, let me, there's, nope, not that one. That's the sermon. Uh, I, I, emailed, I emailed a new copy this morning. It's only four slides, I believe, maybe five slides. It's confusing because I'm adding to these each week. And I'm making it challenging on our guys up there because they're the same. It's just, uh, it's just new slides is, is what it is. We are going to begin in 1 Samuel chapter 13 if you'd like to open your Bible there. We're noticing King Saul's negative 
qualities. We're looking, last week we looked at his positive qualities and we noticed that there are a number of positive qualities uh, out there when it comes to uh, King Saul. Uh, and and there, there, uh, he was obedient to his parents. He, something that's going to come back around, uh, we're going to see in Saul's life a change in Saul is he went from practicing the golden rule, the golden rule, doing unto others, treating them a nice way to, as you know, wanting to kill everybody who disagreed with him, including priest and, and David as well. So he's a completely different person, Saul is, from the beginning to, to where, what he turns into. So that, that right there is, is what I would remember, try to remember from the life of Saul. That is what I would try to remember of how he just completely changed. He just completely changed from uh, his from his beginnings to to he who he was. And sometimes we know people like that. Change is good if we're going in the right direction, of course, drawing near to God. But sometimes people go in the opposite direction. So we're beginning today, First Samuel chapter thirteen. A couple of Saul's negative qualities: his his impatience. Okay, First Samuel. Remember, it was just in the previous chapter that you finally have Saul kind of dedicated as the king his coronation he was he was anointed as king uh, he was proclaimed as the king but in chapter 12 he's finally he's finally dedicated as the king and you remember he won the hearts of the people uh, most of them back in chapter 11 when he went out to battle and and we read how they didn't even have weapons really uh, that you know the, the Philistines had that that charge over them to where they could not have a blacksmith and and, and they had to take their their, their garden tools to the Philistines and pay them just to get them sharpened. So it kind of won over the hearts of the people. But now we start noticing Saul's downfall. Okay, 1 Samuel chapter 13 beginning in verse 1. Saul reigned one year, and when he had reigned two years over Israel, Saul chose for himself 3,000 men of Israel. Uh, 2,000 uh, were with Saul and Michmash, Michmash and in the mountains of Bethel. And a thousand were with Jonathan. That's, that's the son of Saul. We'll, we'll talk a lot about him uh, over the next couple of weeks. In Gibeah of Benjamin. Remember Saul is from Benjamin. Uh, the rest of the people he sent away, every man to his tent. Uh, and Jonathan attacked the garrison, the garrison of the Philistines that was in Geba. And the Philistines heard of it. Then Saul blew the trumpet throughout the land saying, let the Hebrews hear. Now all Israel heard it and said that Saul had attacked the garrison of the Philistines and, had, and that Israel had also become an abomination to the Philistines. And the people were called together to Saul at Gilgal. Then the Philistines gathered together to fight with Israel, 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen and people as the sand which is on the seashore in the multitude. And so they come up and camped against, uh, camps against them in, in Michmash to the east of Beth-Avon. Uh, when the men of Israel saw that they were in danger, for the people were distressed, and the people hid in caves and thickets, uh, in rocks and holes and in pits. And some of the Hebrews crossed over the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. And for Saul, he was still in Gilgal, and all the people followed him trembling. Notice in verse 8, Then he waited seven days according to the time set by Samuel, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. Verse 9, So Saul said, Bring a burnt offering and peace offerings here to me. And he offered the burnt offering. Now it happened as soon as he had finished presenting the burnt offering that Samuel came. Here's his impatience. That's what we're talking about today. And Saul went out to meet him. He might greet him. Samuel said, what have you done? Saul said, when I saw that the people were scattered from me and that you did not come within the days appointed and that the Philistines gathered together at Michmash, then I said, the Philistines now come down to me at Gilgal and I have made supplication to the Lord. Therefore, I felt compelled and offered a burnt offering. Samuel said to Saul, you have done foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. For now the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart. And the Lord has commanded him to be commander over his people. Because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. Now when we read 1 Samuel chapter 13. In the first 14 verses. You know it would probably be common for people to look at similar situations. And just say well what was the big deal with that? 
The big deal was he, as Samuel said, did not obey God. He did not do what God told him to do. He was going against God. And any time we go against God, it is wrong. Even if it seems minor in, in our eyes. Uh, God has said it uh, in, in, the, in the scripture. He, he, he's placed it there for our purpose. And even if we do not always fully understand his purpose, uh, we must remember and realize that his purpose is the best. What he desires is the best. And there's that which we might not see or we might not understand. And then you come around later and say, oh, okay, this, this is why, it's, why it is like this. But notice a couple of things when we talk about Saul being impatient. Notice, notice verse 11. Samuel said, what have you done? Saul said, when I saw. Look at that. Saul's looking through his own Eyes and through what he thinks is best. There's a what is there's a uh, how, how, how's the proverb go? Uh, there, there's a way that that man goes. He thinks it's right, but it's, and it, it's wrong. I can't think exactly how it's worded, but uh, you know when man is right in his own eyes. Here's Saul right in his own eyes, uh, but he's going against what God would have him to do. I thought about this in verse 11. Saul said, "When I saw that the people were scattered, he's." he's He's noticing what he wants to notice rather than doing what God would have him to do. How many times does the Bible credit sin because of something someone saw? I, I don't know that answer. Maybe you're looking for something to study over the next few weeks, and that would be interesting. And it's easy now with everything online. You can do a quick word search. But Eve, Genesis 3, she saw the fruit. That's, that's one time. Achan, the book of Joshua, chapter 6 and 7, when I saw among the, the, the beautiful Babylonian garments, uh, think, think about that. That's, that's something to stop and think about. And here was Saul, well, I, I, this is what I saw, so this is why I did what I did. That's something to think about um, where we're letting our eyes wonder what we're looking at. Or, or when we start viewing things the way we think life should be or the way we think God should operate rather than the way the scriptures tell us. So that's, that's one thing that stands out to me in this count. But notice also in verse 12. Then I said, the Philistines will now come down on me at Gilgal and I have not made supplication to the Lord. Therefore, I felt. I saw and I felt, I felt compelled to do the emotions. This is what I felt like I should do. How many times have you heard someone base their soul's salvation on it feels right? How many times have you heard someone give a defense for what they do, what they did to be saved because I had this feeling and it, 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 was, it felt good, it felt right, it overcame me. They might credit the Holy Spirit overcoming them or whatever. And it, it, it felt right. Then a discussion many years ago with a friend about singing in church. And he credited a group of grown men in a choir, uh, you know, oftentimes crying when they sing because of the emotions and the feelings that go along with it. He said, you can't tell me God's not happy with grown men crying. Well, I've seen grown men cry over a football game. We're going to base our salvation on that? You know? Uh, that's what happens when we get into feelings. Um, and here's Saul. I felt compelled to do this. When we start <clears throat> directing by feelings or what we see rather than what the word of God instructs us to do then we end up like Saul God's you know, going to take the kingdom from you You're going to give it to someone. God's going to give the kingdom to someone else salvation we could apply this of course based on feelings is, is not right think about um, Jacob in the Old Testament Genesis Joseph's dad his feelings were correct with the information he had when he wept over Joseph's death. But Joseph wasn't dead. Brothers lied to him. 
lied to Jacob, said he was dead, but that didn't make it true. He, he responded based on the information he had, but the information was not accurate. The information was not correct. So we need to make sure that, uh, that we are we're responding according to a thus saith the Lord. Rather than what, what we see or what we feel or the emotions or anything like that. Thoughts or comments? Mm -hmm. Yes. Proverbs 16, 25, and 14, 2. Okay. are the verses I was referring to. Uh, could, not, could not recall exactly how to, uh, the, the way they're, they're worded. Thanks so much uh, for that. Uh, Proverbs 14, 2, uh, 12. Proverbs 14, 12. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. This is, this is Saul. This is what's going on with Saul. Uh, in 1625, 1625, there's a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. This is describing what we're reading in 1 Samuel chapter 13. It's also, I, I thought that this was the way that was right. This, this is what I, I thought I should do. And, uh, but he, he went against the Lord. Yes, sir. Saul's example of uh, having the best intentions, because if you think about the, the action of offering sacrifice to God as a beautiful thing, it's something we're supposed to do. It just wasn't proper how we did it. Wow. You know, we, we need to look at things how we do stuff. You know, fundraisers for church work sounds like a great idea. We're going to further the kingdom's work if we, if we go outside and we have car washes and bake sales. You could accomplish all this great work with all this power. That's not the right way to do it. Sure. We could bring others to Christ and we make this auditorium some kind of big entertainment center and you know, flashing lights and, and bands and all that. We could bring lots of people towards God, but it's not right. And there, there are so many examples. Best intentions, you know, the, the path to hell is paved with the best intentions. Absolutely, great point. Uh, Saul probably had good intentions here, and as well in chapter 15 when we get to that. And Samuel is even going to condemn Saul for that. You know, is the Lord delighting in your sacrifices? Well, no, not, not when you're doing wrong and living wrong. And, and that's the point that Samuel is going to get to in chapter 15. Uh, but right, you, you, you see that with a lot of people in the Bible, good intentions, but going against God. And it's never good to go against, uh, against God. It's never right to go against God. And uh, that's, that's a great point. And you see that, of course, in the church today uh, as well. Um, you, you see people with, it, with you know, it, it, it's some maybe in ignorance. That's where church leadership is important and knowledge and sharing with one another and say, well, you know, we, we need to make sure we have authority for what we're doing. Uh, but sometimes, you know, maybe just choosing to go against, uh, completely against. Uh, I've got two comments, but uh, let me mention this quick, quickly. Uh, Basil Overton was from this area. How, how many of you knew? Basil Overton. I, I never knew him, but one of his former students told me that he preached a sermon at chapel. At, I guess it was IBC at the time. Uh, church growth without sin. And he couldn't remember all the points, but I can only imagine that kind of goes in line with what we're talking about here. Sometimes people will, like say entertainment or whatever, will choose a, a simple path with the intentions of, let's fill the building. Let's, let's, I, I, can, I wish I could have heard that sermon or Find that sermon. I think we had Chris, then Trey. Uh, the chapter, that that's, just that prophecy, right? that's right. That's right. That's a good point. You know, we talked about that in our introduction to uh, the kingdom. We go back to the law. You know, God said he's going to take your sons. He's going to build his army. He's going to use them. And you're starting to see that. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, Proverbs about, you know, it seems right, but it brings forth the dead. Well, a lot of times we look at it and go, well, you know, I didn't die, you know, you know. But if we continue in that path, it's, you know, Romans 3, 23. Sure. You know, these are dead, so Romans 6, 23. Right. That's a great point. Going back to our two scriptures in Proverbs, chapters 14 and 16, where it says it seems right, but the end is death. And, you know, some comment might, might be stated, well, I, I didn't die from it, but... Of course, obviously, it's taking you down that road, and we think of death being described in Scripture by at least two ways. Your, your physical death, 
uh, but also your spiritual death, you know, and when, when you separate yourself from God. And how many people like Saul started with one bad decision and then it went to the next and the next and the next. And like, he, like I said, when you look at the life of Saul from chapter 9 to really kind of into chapter 15 and a few chapters later, it's a completely different man. I mean, he's com completely different. That's the reason I wanted to compare the positive and the negative qualities. It's, it's like he's a completely different person from what, again, when you look at it in chapter 13, well, I was just offering a sacrifice. I was just offering this sacrifice. And then into chapter 15, uh, partial obedience. You know, I, I, I did what you told me to do. He just did not do everything God told him to do. And he even is going to try to defend himself and say, well, we're using this to sacrifice to God. That's why we kept the best of the land. We're going to do something good with it. Again, it's never, it's never good to go against God. And that's, that's so true. Uh, so many people, it's one little, I saw, I felt, one little, seems like it's so minor. And then it's the next and the next and the next and the next. And before we know it, again, we just were completely away from God. Jonathan got it, but I mean, that's kind of the story of here. It's all the kings. She passed Saul then going into the, into the kings of Judah. Uh -huh. The kings of Israel are all the things they just didn't do anything at all. Sure. But the kings of Judah, they, all, all the ones that these people, the ones that start out good, I don't, I don't know that there's any word that basically said all the way through that they did exactly what they should have. You know, mm -hmm. usually the, if it's a short summer, usually it's like, okay, well, they did good, except they didn't do this. You know? Yeah. And it's a longer summary than it starts off. They started good, and then they messed up. Yeah. Yeah. You'll definitely, we're definitely going to see that as a, as a reoccurring theme with the kings. Uh, uh, absolutely. We'll see it in David's life. We'll see it in Solomon's life. We'll see it in, in the, the divided kingdom. You know, some, some go back and forth, roller coaster, from good to bad and bad to good. But it's going to be the same thing. And it's, it's, it's the way the world is today. You know, you just, you just see that. You, you, you see that direction that people are going. And uh, unfortunately, it is that, that, con that continual path of going with God and away from God. Notice chapter 15, Saul's partial obedience. I preached a sermon here uh, sometime, I guess, what would be in the last three years. Um, partial obedience from this text. And um, 1 Samuel chapter 15, so we're skipping over a chapter. We'll go back and look at that a little later because that's kind of bringing Jonathan into play. But we're skipping over to chapter 15, uh, verse 1, verse 1, Samuel. Now Saul is still the king. That's something we need to remember. Even though he was told the kingdom is going to be taken from you, and even though we get into chapter 16 and David is anointed as the next king, Saul remains the king until his death. But uh, Samuel is still here. He's still alive. Of course, he's, he's older now. And uh, he said to Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people, over Israel. Now, therefore, heed the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I will punish Amalek for what he did to Israel how he ambushed him on the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and attack Amalek and utterly destroy all they have and do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, infant and nursing child, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. That was his command. That's what Saul was told to do in the first three verses, specifically. And I, I guess maybe it's still, you can find it on, on our YouTube channel or, or, or maybe... Uh, maybe our church website, but not this past summer series, but last year, 2022, you know, Roy Williams, uh, this was his assigned subject. We had difficult text in the Bible. He did a great job with this chapter. You might want to be interested in going back and, if you can, listening to that sermon once again by Roy Williams, summer series of 2022. He did a really good job with that. But um, this is what Saul was told to do. And, and you can see we've, we've included why he was told to do it. Verse 2, because he ambushed Israel, the people of Israel, when they were on the way out of Egypt. So we see what is, what is going on here. And keep this in mind. You know, time did not take away 
generations passed. But it did not take away from God keeping what he said he was going to do. And, and to me, when you, when you read the Bible, it's interesting to see how it all kind of just fits together. It, it all fits together throughout the rest of the Old Testament. And even a lot of the New Testament is making reference back to their days in Egypt and to the wilderness wanderings. Uh, but notice that time does not take away from what is going on. Go back to the book of Exodus, second book of the Bible, Exodus chapter 17. You'll know this text, verses 8 through 16, because it's the one where Joshua is leading the people of Israel in this battle against the people of Amalek. And Moses, when he holds his arms up, the, the people, Joshua and the people of Israel, they're, 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 they're winning the battle. But when his arms fall, um, they're not. And, you know, we can only hold our arms up so long, any of us. And so that's when Aaron, the brother of Moses, verse 10, and her uh, get on either side of him and hold his arms up in the air. But notice in verse 8, beginning, Now Amalek came and fought with Israel in Rephidim. Moses said to Joshua, Choose us some men and go out, fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And then you see that uh, they hold their hands up. Now keep in mind the, 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 the state that Israel is in right now. They've been in Egypt. One Pharaoh was killing all the male children to try to slow down the, the population growth. Then the next Pharaoh, the ten plagues and all of that, and they escape Egypt, Red Sea. They're out in the wilderness. This is the wilderness wanderings. They, they're not a, an established powerhouse. They're as weak as probably anybody can be as they're wandering through the wilderness. And here comes these people from Amalek, and they attack them. Remember, this side note, it's not in your notes, just thought about it, but on one occasion, Moses asked the people of Edom who were in the mountains of Seir, S-E-I-R, can we pass through? And remember, they are, they're kinfolk way down the line. People of Israel, they're descendants of Jacob. The people of Edom, they're, they're descendants of Esau. And they would not let them pass through. They had that, that, that way that they could pass through, and they asked two or three times, if you go back and read the text, can we pass through? And they would not allow it. And, and so they had to go all the way around. And later in the book of Obadiah, this is going to come back up again because of how evil the people of Edom were to Esau on that occasion and other occasions. God's saying, I'm done with you. And, and you're destroyed. You're going to be destroyed. That's, you know, it's easy for people to read 1 Samuel chapter 15 verses 1 through 3 and say, I'm not going to serve that God. I'm not, I'm not doing that. Look what he told them to do. We got to read all of the Bible, put it all together, know everything that's going on. This goes all the way back to what they did to them. When they were weak, when they were traveling, they were catching the, 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 those who were in, in, in the back of this you know, it's not a few hundred people. Some estimates are a million people left um, Egypt, crossed the Red Sea, and went out to the wilderness. And so they, they, were, they attacked them. Then you go to Deuteronomy chapter 25 in the law, the law being given a second time. De Deuteronomy chapter 25, <clears throat> verses uh, 17 through 19. And this is, this is just a reminder. God gave this through the lawgiver Moses. You pass all those generations from Joshua, the judges, Samuel, and now into the, the first king. God is holding to what he said he would do. Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 17. Remember what Amalek did to you on the way as you were coming out of Egypt? But he met you on the way and attacked your rear ranks, all the stragglers at your rear. They were attacking the, 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 those who were weak, those who were behind, they weren't even going after the, 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 the power people, the military people. So when you were tired and weary, he did not fear God. Therefore it shall be when the Lord your God has given you rest from your enemies all around in the land which the Lord your God is giving you to possess as an inheritance that you will blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven 
you shall not forget. That's your background to why God is telling Saul to do this in 1 Samuel chapter 15. Now, let's go back to our text and make some comments. If you know in verses 7, as you know in verses 7 through 35, actually 4 through 35, what happens is, I'm just going to mention it, and I'm, I want to notice some specific verses with you. Saul goes out, and he does what he was told to do. He attacks the people of Amalek. But he does not do everything he was told to do. Uh, verse 8, he also took Agag, king of the Amalekites, alive, and utterly destroyed all the people who were with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep, the oxen, the fatlings, the lamb that was good and were unwilling to utterly destroy them. But everything despised and worthless that they utterly destroyed. Verses 8 9, there's Saul's partial obedience. He went out, he attacked, he destroyed some of them. But he did not do everything he was told to do. And there, again, here's another lesson that we must learn today, partial obedience. Can't just do some of it. We must do everything God tells us to do. Notice just a little bit from this text. First of all, Saul's defense. Verse 13. Samuel went out to Saul and Saul said to him, Blessed are you of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. Let me ask you before we, we'll, we'll probably, it's fine. I'm not going to try to rush through this. We'll have next week, Lord willing. How do you read verse 13? I'm going to hold my comment so it doesn't influence you. I want Anyone would like to share how, how do you read verse 13? And then, then I'll share my thoughts with you. To me, I've got a dog that likes to tear stuff up in the yard and he'll, he'll shred it to pieces and then he'll show up and say, look what I did for you. I've I destroyed whatever you told me to keep precious and I've done such a good job. That's how I look at Saul. I, I did everything you wanted me to do. Check this out. Wagging his tail. And yeah. Yeah. That's similar. That's similar to me, I believe. Uh, JP said he has a dog that sometimes will just destroy something out in his yard. And, and, and look what I did. A happy wagging his tail. That's probably that's similar. That's in line of, in line of what, uh, what, I would, what I'm going, going after. Yeah. In, does anybody see it any, any other way? Read it any other way. Here, here's how I read it. Verse 13. Samuel went to Saul. Saul said to him, Blessed are you of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. Now, I'm not going to ask you to admit to this. But have you ever known that what you did was not exactly right? Maybe when you were a child, mom and daddy told you to do something, and you know what you were supposed to do. You know you were supposed to clean your bedroom, but you know everything is piled under the bed and in the closet. So you know it's not exactly right. Or you know that your husband or your wife was expecting something from you. You even said, I'll do it. And you know that you didn't do it exactly the way you said you would do it. And so as soon as you, as soon as, as soon as you meet together, you, 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 you immediately begin giving a defense. You, maybe at work even. You were, you were given a project. You were given a job. And you know that you did not do it the way that you were told to do it. And, and you, you immediately start giving a defense. That, that's how I see this. That's how I see Saul here. Saul knows that he did not do what he was told to do. So immediately he's trying to get out in front of Samuel, I believe. From the beginning of Blessed are you of the Lord. Hey, friend. Hey, hey, friend. Blessed are you. Bless, Lord, the Lord. May the Lord bless you. I did what the Lord told me to do. Trying to get out in front of it. Knowing he did not do what he was supposed to do. And then you see in verse 14. There, there's, a, there's a funny take on verse 14. Samuel said to Saul, What then is the bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear. Now, I never had the privilege of meeting or hearing uh, the great gospel preacher, Marshall Keeble, but I'm told that he would preach this text 
and his ability to proclaim the word of God and communicate. And I could never imitate that. But he would preach this text and simply say, about that time those sheep told on them. Think about how many times animals told on people in the Bible. Talking donkey. Peter's rooster when it crowed. Think about that. Samuel, Samuel said, oh, you did? You did? Well, what's all this I hear? What's, what's up? Samuel knows what's going on, obviously. He's a prophet. He knows, he knows what's going on. And um, so that's just a couple of thoughts. We're not going to go. We're, we're a minute or two till we're out of time. So we're going to just stay there and we'll pick up continuing in this next week. But, um, but just, just those two verses. Started, Saul is going out to meet him knowing he did not do exactly what he was told to do. And Samuel saying, the proof. There, what? If you did it, why are all these animals here? Why are these sheep and these oxen? What, what are they doing here? Yes, sir. I didn't have to really took that into consideration and how seriously he compares that to how bad it is. Sure, yeah, absolutely. Let's read verses 22 and 23, if you don't mind. Samuel said, this is referring to what JP mentioned earlier, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices? Because Saul's using this as a defense. We're going to sacrifice all these animals. So he's using as his defense. Uh, has the Lord as a great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in, as, as, as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness as iniquity of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. So this, yeah, absolutely, this is very serious. Now, what God is saying here, and you see this also, I think it's in the book of Amos, maybe chapter 5, um, where, where it's, it's straightforward. When, when God through Amos says, I hate your feast days. Basically, they were showing up at church on Sunday, but living worldly, ungodly, sinful lives from Monday through Saturday. And they're, oh, we'll go sacrifice, and everything's okay to cover what we're doing. And God's saying, look, if you're not living for me, the way you should live for me 24-7. These sacrifices, that's, that, 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 wow, that's just show. And that's what you have going on here, I believe. The same, God saying, he wanted you to obey. He, that, that's what he wanted you to do, is to obey. And uh, so, was, it, was that kind of where you're going with that, Greg? That was kind of where you're yeah. going? Okay, yeah. Hey, we'll continue to thought next week. Also, I think your outlines should have our next section where we start comparing the lives of Saul and Jonathan and David. So you can use that to, to read ahead and study ahead. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for your comments. I'm enjoying the study. I hope you are as well. We'll take our break and come back at the top of the hour.